It's time. It's episode 78, the ATM podcast. Every week we welcome back Mark Watson, international commentator, sports broadcaster of much acclaim. My name's Martin Devlin from The Platform. We're going to be talking about Tedesco. He's got to quit the game. We're going to talk about Michael Jennings. He needs to get gone from the game. I want to talk about the Opiki final today and what... Is everyone at New Zealand Rugby a moron or they do, or do they just actually not care about women's rugby? Chiefs and Canes on Saturday night, look forward to. Lawrence Pithy and a seventh in the Paris to Roubaix, which is apparently the hardest road race in world cycling and the wires look great. Apologise to me! Let's start, though, with a couple of leagues. What I want to begin the programme sermonising about this. For, for the good of himself, for his own personal health and safety, it might be too late for James Tedesco, mate. When he admits he's had 10 concussions in his career, he's had seven in the last three years. I think we could probably quadruple those figures. And now to, now to suggest that he thinks it's not going to prohibit the rest of his NRL playing, I just can't even, I mean, I, I'm flabbergasted by that. How can, how can somebody around him not get to him and say, dude, enough's enough? Oh, look, you've got a duty of care, haven't you? Um, you know, let's not use the word concussion. Let's use the word brain injury. He's had 10 brain injuries in his career, 31 years of age. Um, there is a lot of living still to be done. You imagine your child or your teenage son or your son or daughter goes out and picks up one concussion, two concussions in a sports game over a, a short period of time, whether it be, you know, playing club rugby or whatever it might be. You are not going to have them playing that game again, no, are you? No. And it's part of the reason why parents are pulling their kids away from it anyway, because of the ongoing concussion concerns. You need to save him from himself. And this is where the NRL, you know, there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about player safety that goes on. It's all just virtue signaling. You know, you stand up and you go, no, your career is done. Look, we'll offer you a job in league. We'll make sure there's a coaching situation. We'll try and transition you out so it's not too big a step up so that you can deal with suddenly not having the adulation and all of those other wonderful little addictions that probably go with the game, the adrenaline rushes. But take take the example of Steve Thompson, you know, who was a member of that England winning World Cup squad. Now he's got the early onset of dementia he can't even remember the world cup no, final of 2003 that they story, won mm. and now he's starting to realize and he's always come out himself and said it just it's not worth it it's not worth it look at the situation i'm in you know i'm not going to get to enjoy my kids i'm not going to get to enjoy the rest of my life because you know there was probably a little bit more ignorance around concussion at the time for being this combative and playing in this combative sport. And, and, you know, you've heard me say it every week, Martin, your belief system in your 50s is very different to your belief system in your 30s and in your 20s, and it's all as much on us now. But there's a lot of life to still be lived. He's had a very, very good career. He's played state of origin. He's represented Australia. He's played at the highest level across multiple clubs. Enough is enough. But the NRL actually need to step up and do this. They need to make a statement. They need to say, no, duty of care. We cannot employ you anymore due to health issues, due to ongoing uh, risk issues. We're going to see the lawsuits pile up. I've got no sympathy for the NRL. Same. None whatsoever. Same. None whatsoever, mate. Um, no. But I've even seen it in the past. You know, I remember years ago, I think it was, might have been Sean Johnson's previous stint with the Warriors, where, you know, he was absolutely smashed to pieces. And a week later, he's playing again. I mean, you wouldn't put your kid back out on the field a week later. You wouldn't put your kid out for the rest of the year. So why is it okay to put someone else's kid out there? Why is it these players have the ability to go and convince – um, doctors and convince the administrators that, hey, I'm good to go. And these coaches go, yeah, we can't really afford to lose him. He's such a marquee player. She'll be right. She'll be right, mate. He'll be okay. He's telling us he's okay. I, I mean, and where are the doctors in all of this? Don't they sign these oaths and, um, you know, best practice? And it's, it's, you know, a lot of stuff these days is about preventative, isn't it? We don't do any prevention. We talk about prevention, but we don't actually action it. You know, they're part, still parking the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. I, I, I just think it's appalling. It's not, a, it's not a great look for rugby league, Martin. Neither is Michael Jennings, and at least Abdo, Andrew Abdo, the CEO of the NRL, has said we're not going to officially celebrate his 300th game this weekend. I think that that should be where the full stop at the end of the sentence says, your career in the NRL is also over, mate. The fact that they re-signed this guy, and this comes down to the NRL because they have control of the game, and they and every single contract has to go through their desk. Uh, his drug cheat and the fact that he wouldn't actually admit that, that's one thing, okay? You can come back from that. Uh, but the, the spousal abuse and the spousal rape as convicted in a civil court, the amount of money that he's meant to pay his ex-wife and he hasn't paid it, all of that kind of stuff. When a judge turns around and says, on the balance of all probability, you raped her at least four times. I mean, even saying those words, mate, I feel physically ill by saying it. And here are his teammates in the weekend saying, oh, no, that's not important. What's more important is the 300th game. The, the NRL... 
again, a lot of virtue signaling around women in league, all of this, you know, we're protecting this, we support this, we were rainbow this, we were, I mean, just stop it, mate. This is where, you know, to me, the rubber meets the road. You've got a guy here who has been convicted of the most heinous crime there is, okay? Uh, and, 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 and it's clear, it's in black and white, uh, it's it's come out of a court, and yet you're looking the other way and pretending it hasn't happened while he still plays. I think it's an insult that he still laces boots up. Yeah, but they'll still have a women's of rugby league round, yeah, they won't will. they? They um, will. That's, uh, that, uh, that is the complete uh, uh, hypocrisy uh, uh, of this argument. Yeah, and look, I mean, you've had the Jared Haynes situation where one of the great players now in jail for, you know... Um, Serious sexual assault, and yeah. You've got these situations and they come out and they tell you the family game and they go and get these sponsors saying, you come and jump on board because we've got the set of values and there's a lovely synergy between your brand and our brand, not realising that actually all of that comes into major disrepute, put the whole organisation at risk because of one player. But it isn't it. For all the virtue signalling, when you look at rugby league, they're happy to override all of it in the name of performance but he's a good athlete. We need him out there on the park. Forget anything else. I'll say this, and maybe, and this will probably upset a lot of league players, but I always look at the NRL for a long time and say, look, if it actually wasn't for rugby league, a lot of these guys would be in jail. If anything, rugby league has been a, a, a bit of a, you know, it's actually Save provided these for them. Mm. Yeah, a bit of a saviour for them. Now, some people go, oh, that's a bit tough, that's a bit rough. And you go, you might be right, it might have changed now. But when you continue to get these off-field issues of such a serious nature, it actually just reinforces those stereotypes. It just says, this is just an absolute mugs game. This is just a thugs game. And then again, you throw that concussion issue back in there. And it is, it's just a whole lot of virtual signaling. There's just a whole lot of mixed messages. You're preaching one thing, but you're not actually practising. You're not actually serious about it. You're just making sure you don't end up on the front cover because you haven't ticked all of these boxes. And is rugby league any better for having this guy in the game? I don't, I don't, is he putting I, any more I, bubs on no, the seats? No, I, no, just he's say, not. Yeah, I mean, if he doesn't play this weekend, nobody, it, it, and maybe a few Roosters no fans, one misses care, him, but no, no one, one cares. cares no one cares and no, no one, one misses cares. him. Apologise to me! Well, let's turn our attention to the Opiki final. New Zealand rugby once again. I, I'm just staggered by this. Mark, how many people do they employ down there at paying them enormous salaries to run the game of New Zealand rugby? At the moment, we have got a bitter standoff where the board can't agree with the administration, can't agree with the Players Association. It's a living embarrassment. You've got a chair who is, and, 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 and I mean all pun intended, who's an absolute patsy. I mean, she was a diversity employee hire who, who obviously has got no control over what's going on and can't actually link these two groups together. That's a major fail. Then to turn around and schedule the Opiki final and the amount of of garbage that comes out of NZ Rugby about they support women's rugby, they do this women's rugby, it's a growth sport, all of this kind of stuff. And there they go, and they put it at 5 o'clock this Saturday night, eh, up against the Warriors playing Manly, and then straight after that you've got the Chiefs playing the Hurricanes. I mean, how easy was this? Sunday afternoon, 2 or 3 o'clock, make it absolutely free for everyone to come along, put it at a, at a community ground like either on the North Shore or at Pukakoi or somebody like that, and encourage families to come along, put a bouncy castle in there for the kids and make it a day out. How simple was it to do that? And yet they schedule it at Eden Park where there's going to be no spectators at the same time the Warriors are playing. Are they thick or don't they care? They're thick and they don't care. Both. And this is exactly it, mate. And they still somehow believe that this product, because there are people there, you've talked, you know, that are just so desperate for women's rugby to be elevated artificially to the same level as the men's and therefore have the same importance and people are going to turn up. Eden Park, again, Saturday night, five o'clock, will be a cemetery with chips. I mean, to be honest, mate, they could put the super uh, rugby OPACI final anytime. Still, no one's watching it, mate. That, that's the harsh reality. No one's still really going to watch it. But you've got to give it a chance, a, though, don't you? But there's probably a better, yeah, there's probably a better chance that more people will watch it on a Sunday afternoon when the Warriors are not playing than up against the Warriors. And, and you're right, you just sit there. I I mean, I don't know if people have ever tried to apply for jobs with New Zealand rugby, but, you know, their criteria and their selection criteria and you don't meet this and you haven't done this. And you just sit there from the outside going, mate, I could revolutionise your organisation. This is not rocket science. But again, it's this whole. But I think half the problem now with these organisations and you mentioned the chairman of the board and all the rest of it, there is just so much 
gender politics now. There's so much equity and diversity, and that seems to be the priority now when you employ people rather than actually just having the best people put in place. And this whole box ticking exercise, it has actually been put ahead of good commercial decisions now. Huh, totally. I've seen it not just at New Zealand Rugby, I see it, you know, at Sky Television as well. You know, you read the bios of these board members, and it's like, you know, I'm a provocateur, I'm an agent of change, I've been in Forbes magazines, and all of this rubbish and crap that they all tell you about how wonderful they are. And you sit there and go, does anyone actually fact check some of these people, these people that have actually come in and, you know, on their CVs claim to have done all these things? Because I tell you what, it doesn't actually marry up with what is actually no, happening. And the decisions that they I can't mean, seem why, to get right. Like, this is just ridiculous. Not, I mean, this the one. Blues this is just... can't even get a decent crowd to Eden Park on a Friday night. Why in the hell do they think they're somehow going to get an audience along to women's Super Rugby final where there are four teams that play in it anyway, and of that, two are crap and two are okay? 